Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, sixth session of our Open Education Cafe. This session in particular is merging two different series of our cafes. The first one was focusing on open education champions at the European level, but then we wanted to enlarge the margins, of course, and uh, make this uh, new series global. So we have now the Pass the Open Education Expert Baton uh, series. This is the new name of this series. And today we have wonderful guests from the Higher Education for Good team, which counts more than 70 authors in total, plus two uh, magic editors, uh, Catherine Cronin and Laura Smirgis. Uh, so uh, I'm Paola Corti. Together with me, uh, you will have as a facilitator for this discussion, Andrea Davidson, who is a dear colleague of mine. And this session is going to be recorded so that anyone will be welcome to look at it afterwards uh, on our NOL for Open YouTube channel. Um, we are recording this event, as I said. So if you want to open your microphone and your webcam, just please be conscious that we are recording. Uh, so, first of all, let me welcome our uh, guests. We have Katrin Cronin, who is an independent scholar whose work focuses on critical and social justice approaches in digital, open and higher education. Katrin has published widely and openly on critical and social justice <clears throat> approaches, digital and open education and intersectional feminism. And she has a blog, blogs, and share uh, scholarships at her own blog that is here. And I'm go going to share the link with all of you in the chat. So if you want to have a look, here it is. And in the room, we have Robin De Rosa. Welcome, Robin, who is the Director of Learning and Libraries at Plymouth State University, a public university in the New Hampshire in the USA. And while her academic training was originally focused on early American literature and history, she now reaches and writes about higher education and advocates for open, public, and sustainable futures for learning. And you can read more about Robin here if you want to. Um, and then we have Caroline Kuhn, uh, who came from Venezuela to Europe to pursue a PhD. And now she's a senior lecturer based at the School of Education at Bath Spa University in the UK. Her research focuses on the intersection of sociology, philosophy, technology, and education. She's particularly interested in open education and social justice framed under a critical pedagogy approach. She's also interested in issues of data justice and how technology can be meaningfully integrated into resource-constrained context so that different ways of knowing and being are respected and agency is fostered. We have Judith Pitt, uh, who is a Kenyan with extensive expertise in management, finance, human resources, and online learning. She holds a PhD in management, science and technology from the Open University in the Netherlands and a master's in business administration and financial management. She is now based in Canada with more than 14 years of experience as an educator in Nairobi, in Kenya. She is, current, she is uh, currently interested in uh, AI and higher education in Africa. And in addition to her academic career, she has published extensively in open education resources and practices. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the room. We also have uh, uh, Juliana Raffagelli, who is a part of the team of the authors of one of those chapters that we have here. Juliana, welcome to this room. And Juliana is based in Italy and University of Padova. Uh, so I'm very happy to have you here with us too. So as you can easily imagine, uh, in order to remember all those details, I had some notes here, but now I'm going to... Oh yes, and I have some news about Juliana, sorry. Now that I have them, I can share. Uh, she's an assistant professor in educational research and experimental pedagogy at the University of Padua as I said, and she's actively, she actively practices the values of open science and education, exploring the impacts on educators' professional identities. She's also an associated researcher 
of the research group EduLab in Universitat Oberta de Catalunya in Spain and associated researcher <coughs> to uh, a department of the research, the, the Center for Research in Philosophical and Cultural Anthropology uh, in the National Commission of Science and Technology in Argentina. I hope that I didn't make mistakes with that. You're all welcome. And I really like for you, if you're happy to, to briefly introduce yourself, most of all, connecting what you do now today with uh, the work that you did within uh, the uh, Higher Education for Good uh, book umbrella, because that's our topic today, what we can do at the global level to contribute to higher education for good. So welcome again. Maybe we can start with Catherine, who is one of the two great editors of this book. Thank you so much, uh, Paula, Vanessa, and the NOL Network for inviting us here today. It's um, it's a real pleasure to join these wonderful women who I'm going to be speaking with today. And um, and I also really appreciate the fact that it's uh, it's informal and a real conversation rather than presentation style. So we can talk about what's happening now. Um, so thank you. Um, for possibly anyone who's listening who might not realize or know already what higher education for good is, I'll just say briefly um, that higher education for good is a book that was published in October 2023. I was thinking, <laughs> thanks, Robin. I was thinking while you were speaking, Paula, that the idea for the book was born exactly three years ago, June 2021, Laura Chernrich and myself. We're just speaking about the, <clears throat> how the higher education sector is just reeling from the pandemic, certainly at that time, um, economic, ecological, health, social crises. Um, we were feeling and observing a lot of despair in, in the higher education sector about where higher education was going. And we just wanted to work together with colleagues globally to try and explore what good could look like in the sector going forward and be really explicit and plant a flag um, about what that could be uh, for our own benefit and the benefit of, of anyone who might um, write or read the book. So I'm here today with four authors who are in the book. So the book was published, what, six, seven months ago, and there have been so many follow-on conversations about the book since then which have been, it's been, it's been really interesting how, how it has struck a chord with people. One thing I learned is that when you are an editor of a book, lots of people will contact you because your name is on the cover of the book. But we, Laura and I really didn't want the conversation to be through us. The work that's in the book is phenomenal, truly global, 71 authors in 18 countries. So we are, always trying to do events like this, where, where we're happy to come along as editors and conveners of the project, but really foreground the work of the wonderful authors. So I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and I, I can talk more about the book, the chapters and so on as we go along, but that's it for starters. And thank you, Catherine, because uh, we've been seeing a lot of movement around this book lately and it's good to to see that uh, many platforms are offered uh, to give visibility to the content of this book under different uh, perspectives which is always interesting because uh, you can read this book through different uh, uh, themes and uh, it always offers you uh, some good thoughts uh, and some good reflections to consider what to do next uh, so one of the things that I want to, 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 that I'm looking forward for today is to listen also to the, the authors of specific chapters. And I'm going to call you on, uh, on that because I, uh, I really want to see what uh, our participants to this session can do in their context moving forward. And uh, if it is okay, I would give now the floor to Robin De Rosa because uh, what, she's, what she shared in her chapter, which is the first in uh, higher education for, for good, uh, and is focused on writing from the wreckage, that's the title, Austerity and the Public University. So that's the title, and this is the link available. Yes, it works. Uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Can you tell us something about your chapter and what you're doing today? I am living my chapter today. I will talk about that. Um, 
And I wanted to start by saying um, how I what I love most about open is the way it changes knowledge from something static to something dynamic. It and that by nature is a collaborative movement, right? It it says instead of being done, it the borders are still open and things are still changing. And and being part of this book has really been about embodying that. I feel like the book is a community rather than, you know, I did buy a print copy and I sort of love the fact that it's so, it's giant. Like it, it's almost impossible to, to um, read from it because it's so big. And I think that's because um, it's not meant, you know, to be something that sits on your desk. It is very alive. And so I've really enjoyed all of the conversations that have popped up and all of the um, authors who continue to meet and talk about, about the work. Um, and I will also say when I first got the call for papers, you know, for submissions to this book, I thought immediately, oh, this is like what I what I'm here for, right? This is everything about my work now is focused on, on the wicked problem of how to do and be good in spaces that are so very challenging in education. Um, but I almost did not submit anything um, because I couldn't get to the good in my writing. I was feeling <laughs> so beat down. Um, I'm very privileged. I have a, a, a tenured position at a you know struggling university, but but a place that you know has existed since the 1830s. I have a solid job, but most of the people that I work with are precarious. And I, I just really on a daily basis was not seeing the hope um, as much as that's where I had started from. Um, the more I was immersed in the work, the less hopeful I was feeling. And I thought, I'm going to derail this project, you know, which is not what I want to do. Um, but I had a colleague friend who many of you know, her name is Kate Bowles. Um, and she and I sort of every night would send a note like, did you make any progress on your submission no, because I just don't feel it. I don't feel it. And by talking to each other, I think we decided um, not to try to overcome our feelings of being um, uh, sort of oppressed by working in the environment of higher education right now, but instead to, to dive into that. And that's really the work of my chapter was to go deep into the particularly structural and historical and political problems that are making our work um, so very exhausting. And I was so grateful when Catherine and Laura called me and said, you know, we're thinking of making your piece the first piece because I really felt like what they were doing was acknowledging you can't go around what's hard to get to what's good. You have to go through it. And that's really what my chapter is about. It's about particularly looking at um, what I've kind of settled on as, you know, one conceptual framework for the damage that is continually being done in the name of higher education. And that is around neoliberalism, which, um, I do define in the chapter, but I really think about it as kind of the, the privatizing of the public good. Um, so all of the ways that, in many ways, the stuff that we're really all about in open, which to me is a word that has a lot of kinship with the word public, um, the idea that an open community isn't just, you know, to go back to the tragedy of the commons idea, the idea that anyone can take anything they want at any time. The idea of open, like a public, is the idea that there are governing community agreements that keep us working in harmony in sustainable ways. And the idea of neoliberalism is that most of those things are only allowed if they serve the profit motive and profit supplants the idea of this sense of the public good. And really 
my work has changed over the years from really being interested in pedagogy. That's how I got into open ed was thinking, oh my gosh, look at all the cool things I can do as a professor. If I'm using open resources and I'm thinking about knowledge in new and open ways and, and it just transformed my teaching. But now really what I focus on in my daily work, I'm a library director now. And really I don't do a lot of that fun stuff anymore because in order to do that, I have to keep my institution open and and viable. And if my institution closes, which is a rural um, regional university, we serve um, mainly Pell eligible students. These are students in the United States, um, you know, mostly at the poverty level in rural communities. Um, and we've been here since the early 1800s. And in the last three years, it looks like we might not be here very much longer. And that is a, a thing we're seeing all over the world in public higher education in particular is um, the sort of squeezing out of these public places to learn in favor of uh, more consolidated, less accessible, um, privatized institutions. Um, so the most recent thing I did related to my chapter was deal with a, um, losing 15% of our library budget, which means we had to cut um, a significant number of the databases that our students rely on for their research. So in my field, originally that's the MLA database no longer affordable. Chronicle of Higher Education had to cancel it. New York Times can't buy it. Um, so what I'm thinking about here all the time is not only, oh my gosh, we're, we're defunded. We don't have public monies to operate anymore. Um, I, I'm dealing with new legislation in my state against diversity, equity, and inclusion literal laws that prevent us from talking about certain things in the classroom. <clears throat> as much as all of that stuff is going on, I'm also thinking about academic publishing and how broken it is that we had to pay this much money in the first place to access the knowledge that our students had, right? So interestingly, I feel like most of my research is very applied now. It's really about getting in here and fighting for my students, my colleagues, their ability to take a class, read a book. You know, I'm not so interested in publishing books of my own. I'm I'm trying to put out a, a big fire. And that's against the landscape of our upcoming election where um, Trump is, you know, likely going to be running from jail um, and the backdrop of what's just happened in, in Europe. Um, so that that's what I where I am. I'm um, taking a page from um, Greta Thunberg, who said, you know, it's not always about hope. Sometimes it's about panic, and I need more people to be um, panicking and looking at the reality. So my goal is to help. Uh, regular faculty and staff who do their own regular jobs, right? They're, they're in there working in financial aid or they're teaching chemistry. I want them to understand the backdrop in which we labor now um, so that we can have more advocates at the table for doing the work that this volume is trying to do. So that's... Thank you, Robin. I like what you said about uh, the difference between being hopeful and, be, and starting to panic, because it's. Uh, it, I, I agree that uh, starting to face what's the reality of the challenges that we are facing, that we should face sometimes, and instead of hiding our heads behind the sand, uh, it's the, the, the first step. To, to face them and to succeed with hope because the people are interested in solving those issues. But we, first of all, we have to recognize that there are issues to be solved. And uh, we always, uh, uh, at the European level, we have many universities talking about uh, sustainable development goals and not only in Europe, of course. But what happens is that when you talk about quality education for all, it does mean something. <laughs> So it requires to act accordingly. It, it's not only a uh, mouthful. So um, it's, it's good to have uh, guiding uh, goals 
for us to talk to, but uh, acting accordingly is another step. And I'm happy that we are here to discuss also the practical steps. But before we go to the practical steps, I would like uh, to involve my, I'm calling you in, Andrea. Andrea Davidson, who is my colleague at Spark Europe, because I would love you to, to introduce uh, and to ask questions to the next group around the next chapter. <laughs> Thank you, Paula, and hello, everyone. Next up, we have the three co-authors uh, of the 21st chapter of Higher Education for Book called Critical Data Literacies for Good. It's wonderful to have all three of you with us today. And um, I'd like to call on all of you, Caroline, uh, Juliana, and Judith, uh, if you'd like to speak, uh, could you please introduce yourselves and briefly tell us what you're working on now and especially how that relates to the aims and values that your chapter expresses. Who'd like to go first? I don't know, Judith, do you wanna go first? Perfect, I do it. And now uh, I'm Judith Pete. I work in Nairobi, Kenya, and currently I'm visiting in Canada. I am an educator for a long time now, around uh, 15 years. And as an educator, uh, way back when we started the discussion with Caroline, 2021 and 2022, talking about data literacy, I was like, Carol, but how do we have how, how do we approach this? And then she's like, no, we and Juliana, we've spoken about how we want to contribute and to ensure that data justice is practiced across the globe. And there's this publication that is called Higher Education for Good. And I'm like, uh -huh higher education for good, and it's an open publishing. I'm like, okay, so we need to do something. Now, this was a class that I was taking up then, and uh, I was teaching the students a course by the name Climate Change. Now, uh, change management is an issue that is currently being focused on in several countries, especially in the nations of Africa. And the process of changes, irrespective of what angle you look at it, requires a lot of critical thinking and bridging uh, uh, gaps that has always been in existence. And now, as an educator for many years, I've, I have come to realize that uh, information is power. And when we talk about data, data is everything. And especially in the current technological uh, uh, focused world, uh, I have been organizing and living the reality of our chapter 21 on critical data literacies through many uh, forums that I've been organizing with my students. I promote open access and open practices. And to this effect, we have built, a, a, I would say, a, a platform in which every month we have a topic that relates to climate justice. Matters of climate has become an issue, especially in my continent. And so when we organize these climate justice talks in different approaches, the first we talked about then uh, how, how resilience can we be when it comes to climate issues, the other topic was talked about on the, the, the data around the world and how Africa is feeling the pinch in, and it comes to climate change. And these are normally organized by our students and faculty take lead in terms of guiding the students on how these discussions could lead uh, to uh, strategic changes that could help us have sustainable solutions to the climate issues that we face currently. So I am leaving my chapter, just as the previous uh, speaker said. We I'm leaving our chapter because um, there are many issues that are coming up, especially when we talk about artificial intelligence. I was sharing just prior before we started the discussion uh, formally that uh, I think we were prophets way back to have just selected matters or issues pertaining data. Data is, is everything. In one of the conferences, in fact, I'll be presenting uh, this week at uh, uh, Otesa, the well-known Otesa conference. And uh, I'm, I'm with three colleagues of mine and we are talking about issues uh, on artificial intelligence. Is it for or against the human? And my major focus is on uh, AI in the nations of Africa. There is one question that I've put on the um, uh, 
meta uh, uh, analysis and I would like uh, answers from it. And I did it in the previous conference last year. What is in Africa that AI users globally can tap? And the first response that anybody can give you is about the unique data sets and data diversity. And therefore data is something that uh, we really just have to ensure that we understand and we openly and freely offer if we need solutions to challenges that we are facing across the globe. Uh, when I become a bit specific, uh, we have very unique, diverse cultures and languages and environments that will provide unique data sets for training AI models. Now, these models can help us in transforming and bridging the gaps that librarians could be facing, that practitioners could be facing, and of course, the stakeholders in our institutions could be facing in the, 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 the wide technological uses in higher education. And so when we talk about critical data analysis, the question that we had then was how good are the practices and the processes? And my response then was that good is relative. But my response today is that it is doable. And I echo what the previous presenter mentioned about the aspect of panic. Panic is very good. Because when we panic, we look for solutions. When we panic, we think. When we panic, we look for partnerships. And these are ways in which we are going to build together to ensure that what we yearn for in terms of open access to reasonable data across the globe and for common good for everyone is going to take place. So uh, I would like to uh, share here that climate justice issues require open data for climate change solutions. This data, if critically and consciously utilized can help us in fixing gaps that has been in existence from the time immemorial. And therefore, open access as an educator should be a practice that is mandatory to all educators in higher institutions. And common good should include everyone and everywhere for a common purpose. Let me stop there for now. Thank you so much, Judith. That was inspiring to listen to. This is an idea of panic. It's not like being a deer stuck in the headlights. It's really the moment that makes you think and uh, putting together this, this book where all of you and, and the other authors and editors thought together. I can see, I can see this is so inspiring. Thank you. Also, I noticed this an interesting connection between your emphasis on climate justice and data justice and open education. And Robin getting inspiration from the words of Greta Thunberg. There's a really important nexus here. I, I know others will talk, but I'll ask Catherine at the end maybe too, because that really became a theme that the, the people involved in the collection did talk about as we were putting it together. Thanks. I'd like to invite the other authors of chapter 21 to, to introduce themselves too. Juliana, you go ahead. Oh, thank you, Caroline. Um, I will be brief because, I mean, uh, Judith was so eloquent, and uh, I am also speaking in a language that is not my mother tongue, and I'm not quite proficient. I mean, I use English for work, but it's not my language. I, I want to say that this fact is already a, a crucial part in the way we make science and uh, because in my, I'm in a different position to express my ideas. I would be much more eloquent in another uh, language like Spanish, which is uh, my mother tongue uh, shared with uh, with Caroline. And uh, I, I would like to say with uh, Laura Ternievitz uh, saying uh, uh, that uh, uh, I, I will quote her in the academic domain, indications are that knowledge patterns continue to reflect physically based geopolitical realities where knowledge from the South is peripheral, while knowledge from the North still dominates in terms of all the conventional measures. I would say also may knowledge dominate. And what, what I want to express here is uh, a huge gratitude 
Catherine and Laura uh, for making possible the fact that we are all women here having uh, the uh, great enough to criticize a system that is still enthusiastically embraced. Because if we take a look at, uh, say, European elections and uh, what is happening in the world with uh, neoliberalism, uh, we will uh, understand that we still believe that technology fast, fastly produced uh, will lead us to change. Uh, and we are not reflecting enough about human values and relationships, about complexity and the need of context, contextual reflection as Judith was uh, asking for. I am also very grateful about Robin's introduction. Uh, the, her uh, metaphor of wreckage is really powerful and the fact, I mean, in, in your chapter, the fact, uh, the way you reflect about uh, the system that is producing so so much harm, as, as, as is quite uh, appreciated in your chapter. So we are brave enough in this space and in this book to um, say to spend words about the damage and the harm, and to instill that panic. <laughs> to some extent, but we are also hopeful because I see in a, in all of our chapters there is hope. There is beauty. I also read Paula's uh, chapter about that is uh, uh, supported by um, poetry. So we use art and we use alternative ways of knowledge. And um, what I was I was really um, glad to work with uh, Caroline, upon Caroline invitation, uh, and with Judy, because they were sources of energy uh, and care for me uh, along the process, because we could fully embrace our being half south, half north. Our, our identities are really complicated, complicated because, for example, uh, Caroline and me, we are South Americans and here in Europe, but with uh, great grandparents from, from Europe and with all of them. And, uh, and uh, talking with Judith ha has been so many times collaborating and working in, in networks in and all. So trying to question epistemic justice and thinking about uh, critical data and uh, knowledge production from this uh, complex idea of contextualized, situated identity and uh, that, that needs to emerge and that we need to uh, take care of. So I don't know whether I was really clear about, and my point was really, um, um, focus on one simple idea. I uh, just expressed many of the feelings that um, I uh, that, that, that were with me along the process of writing this chapter. Um, I think so many things about data and critical data uh, just and critical data literacy and data justice were said by Judith and I, I want to also to make space uh, for Caroline to uh, I mean, talk about the more specific uh, ideas about uh, data literacy and data. But I wanted to, I mean, talk about that point, about the systemic justice, the possibility that were, was given to us within the book through the process of sharing uh, uh, with us as a complex uh, group uh, to deal with uh, epistemic justice. So, this is my. Thank you. There's that dimension of, of the collaboration and the writing process that you don't always see when you when you read, but it's uh, so special to get an insight into the, the the work that you did together, how that worked, and and of course the the epistemic justice that you enacted as you worked together. Caroline, would you also like to introduce yourself and speak to how your work now relates to the chapter that you wrote? Yes, thank you. Um... So, so I'm Caroline and I work at a university in Bath in, in England. I was raised and born in Venezuela with German parents. So I, I'm really 
I have always been in very mixed spaces where German is the first language and you go to school and you speak Spanish, but you have never spoken Spanish at home and you learn immersive, you know, immersive learning. So I think this kind of mixed identity is a place where I feel very comfortable, if that is a way of describing it. And um, the work with uh, Juliana and with Judith, I think, has been um, a very rich experience because, you know, we, we I think the three of us brought different expertise to the team. Um, so this was, let's say, Data Praxis was a, a bigger project and it had like chapters. And one of the chapters was Kenya because we knew Judith through open education. And again, how open really um, offers a network where you can then extend the work you do outside of the space where you meet these people. And that's the case with, with Judith. And then this Kenya chapter um, really was, was designed um, with Juliana and Judith in relation with what are the needs of the Kenyan context? What is it that, what, what are the injustices? What is it that we should focus on? And it was about the invisibility of data and you know what we see now in artificial intelligence that people are not well represented and they, they weren't. And, 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 and so I guess that's how all the, the work there, which we then um, share in the chapter, what's the experience, how it was. But I think the beauty of it is that, you know, uh, uh, Judith provided her experience in open education, her experience as a teacher, as, a, as, a, as someone that really has um, a very open and very warm relationship with her students. Um, and then the expertise of Juliana in open um in a way, it it was about the 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 date. So data cul data culture. So what happens with data and the culture where where you use it or where you have these data driven systems? Um, and I was um, I would say very keen about critical pedagogy, critical consciousness, and how can we? And so what I what I feel is very beautiful in this chapter is that we we really had a, a very rich generative synergy where we served really the needs of those students and the need of, as Judy was saying, climate change is an issue. Um, and so I think serving that purpose makes this particular case a, a, a lift experience of, of higher education for the for the good, for the, you know, for, for the betterment of, of society, of the community, of the university, of, of their own kind of small communities. And, and, and I would say, yeah, it, it was very beautiful. It's, it, it also, I think it's always sometimes hard to make things happen. And, you know, you have these hurdles and you have to go up and down. And it was very also, um, yeah, I would say very nice to navigate this together. And then to write together is another thing that I find very, yeah, very enriching. And and at the moment, I, I was wanting to say, so I'm working on, on a project um, in Kenya, particularly. Um, it's um, I think it's a place very dear to my heart, um, still to know why. I think it's the wonderful people that live in Kenya. And, and the idea really is here. And I, I you know, I, I hear what Robin is saying. I experienced that in Venezuela. So we had to choose between providing food for the whole students at the university or the databases for the journal. And so we chose students and their their well-being. And so we, we lost all the the access to all of those. So I, I lift this and I, and I can feel the pain. Um, but there is something here that I feel and which is what we're trying to work here is how do you how do you how do you honor local knowledge ancestral knowledge experience that people have in the land um, and higher education and it's technical let's say knowledge right the techniques the science the labs um, if we think about the dairy industry or um, regenerative agriculture and if you think this in a different way, I think the university provides you with very important knowledge about 
the techniques and you know what what that science offers you but then local knowledge needs to come in for it to be meaningful and not only that but for so that the local context is able to flourish and not only you know Nairobi or the centers where these higher educations are but also these local communities which have been abandoned and and that's the case in Venezuela as well you know rural communities have very very precarious access to higher education to any education whatsoever so um I am working in um very slowly it's a very beautiful from the ground very slowly slow pace and honoring um local communities and local knowledges trying to put that together with higher education and technical knowledge and then how would um, a learning framework look like if if that makes sense where we can blend these two things and then the way in which we look at technology is a very convivial way where we're not wanting this big tech to take over and oppress people but we would like to really create the technology from within, technology that would be maybe gender sensitive, technology that is very low in, in, in you know, in internet um, consumption, in specificity, so that it's a technology that makes people in the local villages feel that they have agency and that there is something for them in that technology, if that makes sense, instead of the technology oppressing people. And one of the things I'm very keen of is that human dimension of the socio-technical system. How does that human dimension look like in an agency in particular? Um, and so, you know, I, I think that having worked with Juliana and Judith has, yeah, given me, I would say, broaden my landscape, my understanding, um, it has humbled me also to, um, yeah, to just work with other people that have a, a different reality than the one we are immersed. And so, yeah, I think I am still working in the same space, but maybe with, with yeah, with a different, let's say, with a different, I don't know, project, if that makes sense. But, but the inspiration and the openness and the respect for the local culture and the local knowledge and the ancestral knowledge is, is, is at the forefront of, of what I do. And I think open there is, is, is really, I would say, it's like the umbrella that honors all of that. And I would say it might sound ideal or cheesy, but I think it happens in real life. And the chapter is, is one example of that. And also I, I think that um, Laura and Catherine I think they are very, very generous. So, you know, you struggle to write, you don't write exactly well. Juliana was saying, you know, none of us is English native speakers, so our writing is maybe clunky or, you know, we are also not here in this experience level that we're, we're I would say more we are, well, maybe Juliana is, is the more experienced one in, 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 in that research space or, and Judy, but I feel I'm, I'm kind of on that, you know, taking off. And I think they were very kind and very generous and very, very helpful in, 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 yeah, in bringing these three voices in a harmonic way together and all of these 71, um, you know, voices in that book. And, and it has been, um, yeah, a, a wonderful experience, I think. And I, I would really say thank you to both of them because it has been wonderful. If I can uh, add to that, um, the, listening to all of you so far um, it continuously comes to mind to me that it feels like uh, uh, there's an extended collective identity in this room and uh, which doesn't mean that we are all the same or that there is no space for diversity the opposite maybe but with a very conscious and intentional uh, approach and behavior that makes a uh, uh, my work feed in the next person close to me uh, and I can learn from them, but they can also take my work and make it uh, go farther because I don't have the means or the knowledge and someone else can lead it forward for the best. So, uh, and I agree being also a small part of this project that what Laura and Catherine did with all of us is not only to enable us 
continuously and encourage us, but really creating a space where all the 70 plus authors can uh, keep their identity and contribute to something that was larger than any single chapter. But now uh, we go to the next step. So, so what? <laughs> what are we doing now with what with what we built together and all that the, contrib the contributions that you provided through your chapters? What's the next step? How can we contribute to make um, good at the heart of higher education? Um, how can we make this uh, even more important if it is not always the case? How do we get it right? How can we ensure it? And what difference can it make to, to focus on good in higher education? So, if I may, I want to say something here because I, I want to um, echo what Robin was saying, uh, you know, I think the United States in particular is, a, is, a, is in a terrible crisis. Uh, I'm not saying the UK is not, but I think it's different still. You know, we, we're, we're going there, but, um, but we're not there yet, I would say. And I think if we want to do good and if we want to inhabit mm. a higher education for good, we have to be... Um, we have to fight in a way for having open access publishing. We have so that Robin can take all of that without having the money to, to buy these, you know, root ledge or whatever it is, but that the that the majority of the of the work is published in the open. Because I think that's the way in which, for example, people in the university. Just saying where Robin is, for example, or in the University of Simon Bolivar in Venezuela, where I was, they have access to this because it's not under a paid wall. Um, and, and I think I, I think it's not easy, again, to do this. Um, it's, uh, there is a lot of hidden stuff in these publishing journal stuff. I had a terrible fight with one of them. And I think we need to really pursue to publish open access. This is something I know may be very pragmatic um, and maybe not very philosophical, but I think there is something that, an action that we can do so that we can help Robin in particular, that we know that we have in mind, but as Robin, so many others that are losing access to knowledge. And we know that knowledge only can be created if you build on existing knowledge and that existing knowledge needs to be published. And mm -hmm. here, if we don't have open access then, you know, you you. It's it's a really very. I don't know if, if the right word is perverse, but it's a very. I would say, yeah, it's a, it's very subtle. But people are left behind just because they don't have access to, to open knowledge. You know, to open, let's say, research. So I think this is one thing we can't. We, so what? Well, let's fight to publish open access, and this is what we should do. And if it means that we don't publish with Springer fabulous uh you know well then it's not then it's with someone that is less famous but that will enable other people to access that knowledge and this is what i i think is for me is the fight what do I, the I other also, authors and i think part of it too is about um you know one of the one of the ways we've tried to do open access here is you know we talk to faculty about put your work in our institutional repository and try to publish with an open access press. And we have a very small, like, you know, $2,000 set aside to assist faculty paying for author pay over open access. But the problem I think with a lot of that stuff is that the system, including what I would call a very corrupt um, academic publishing world, understands how to co-opt all of the language of open and parcel out just enough access to basically own and control the open access movement. And so I don't think there's any real way to move the needle on open access publishing unless we have a wide education with every faculty and staff member <clears throat> in higher education to explain academic publishing, right? Because for example, when we're cutting all these databases right now, our faculty are you know, horrified and upset 
But in order to understand exactly why we're cutting, for example, you know, the MLA database, they really need to understand how academic publishing is generally working and how they are contributing to it. So I think part of what we have to do is as we're moving in all of these small ways to open, right, like encouraging people to put something in a repository or publish open access, we need to really be explaining the systems that are controlling things um, so that at every level, for example, in promotion and tenure, when we are, you know, people want their citation index to look a certain way, otherwise they won't get recognized by their institution to get a, you know, a raise in order to live. We have to help them understand that we are participating in this system. So I think it's not just about making interventions towards open, it's about resisting the whole term of the debate and changing those terms um, because this is the same thing in OER as well. If you're just trying to like, reduce the cost of a particular thing, um, you can actually reduce that cost really effectively while potentially doing harm to the greater ecosystem. So for example, you can reduce the costs of a student's biology textbook by partnering with Barnes and Noble on an inclusive access program. But in doing that, you're actually raising the average cost across the board of all of you know, textbooks for students. So we have to make sure that the solutions that we are choosing <laughs> are not handed to us by the system that is perpetuating the problems. And so I think what that means is wide education to faculty about the facets of our work that are not part of our PhDs, say. Um, or, for example, contingent faculty who are teaching multiple precarious contracts and only have time to just barely do their grading, right? Th these are the things that allow the system to continue because we don't have the time or the energy focused on examining the system that we're all part of. So I actually think faculty development centers have to stop just focusing on pedagogy and start focusing a little bit on the structural inequities that are organizing our labor um, and help faculty you know, make more informed choices because eventually that comes down and bites you in the butt when you can't afford your, you know, database anymore. But by then it's too late, right? To really, um, to really make a difference. And, and I also think in addition uh, to what uh, uh, you've mentioned, which I really appreciate because uh, educators are influencers and they can be the best uh, advocates to this process. And so I think if we have infrastructures that support the faculty, then we get it. Uh, I, I remember, and I know very well that in most of the institutions, uh, uh, specifically in our continent, um, base ranking, academic rankings mm -hmm. on publications and also uh, engagement in community practices. And so if we, we, we can sometimes, uh, I think we can be able to lobby and advocate on how training and development could be tailor-made towards enhancing the, the goodness of the faculty so that they, they feel supported, providing those small grants for their research work. Uh, and and supporting them by providing or giving them opportunity to do their researches, not teaching all the time. These are motivators to towards achieving what we call the good. And more importantly, I will echo here the fact that inclusivity, especially in decision making, is quite crucial. We need to be uh, to 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 encourage that all should feel included, so that they can be able to own the process. And once they own the process, then sustainability is assured. Mm -hmm. And also. Uh, 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 the, the the equity part of it in uh, higher education is quite crucial. So we need to build infrastructures that enhances inclusivity and equity. And especially uh, if the educator, who are also the influencers to the entire process, feel that they are valued and that their thoughts are met, they feel supported, then they'll protect the process. And that is also one way that we can be able to ensure sustainability of such kind of processes. Here, here, yeah. Um, I know our time is short, Paula. I feel like we could talk for so much longer. It is so moving to be in this room with 
all of you women and, you know, people sharing just the care, the wisdom, the mutuality, you know, speaking across all of our different contexts and global north, global south and so on. I mean, this is this is how to wrestle with problems. Um, just a couple of threads to pick up. I agree with so much of what was said. Robin talked about public good and Judith was talking about common good. And I just wanted to give a pointer to chapter 12 in the book. And Pine Mako from South Africa does this beautiful analysis of all the different definitions of good from her context and talks about, and she really uh, analyzes public good and common good. And just that comp the, the extra aspect of common good is that there's a collectivity in terms of how goods are produced and shared. So things can be a public good, but owned by the state or the government, but common good gets to what we've just been talking about, about openness and mutuality and sharing. And finally, I just wanted to, you know, so much of what was mentioned today hits on the tenets of the Manifesto for Higher Education for Good, which is in the introduction to the book. And that manifesto really tried to pull threads from across all of these amazing chapters. Robin's, you know, when Robin sent in her chapter, we knew it was chapter one. And the first tenet is name and analyze the troubles of higher education, because we can't do anything unless we we do that. And, and that was so powerfully said here today by you all. And then the others are challenge assumptions and reduced hegemonies about publish academic publishing and so on, make claims for just humane and globally sustainable higher education. And that aspect of making positive claims, explaining what could be, you know, and sometimes that's imaginatively, um, but just painting pictures for people to move towards um, alternatives to the way things are. And I know Robin quoted Eddie Glaude, who is just, such, you know, his writing is such an inspiration of mine as well. And he has this lovely expression of, we can stand askance to the way things are. Um, when he, he in his book about the writings of James Baldwin, and I just I always hold on to that that phrase to, that we can stand askance to the way things are in higher education now, um, and work and be different. I'm, I'm looking at the time, so I'll stop. Yes, yes, and thank you all for sharing so much. If you have a last message that you want to give in the hands of librarians specifically, because that's a uh, our community in the network but anyone else also if you if you have something that you have in mind that they can enact starting today starting tomorrow uh, or to focus on to uh, go in the direction that uh, doesn't avoid panic but looks into uh, good opportunities to change things in practice that's the moment <laughs> I just want to say that um, in my career, I think I have followed what I consider to be the need. You know, I started as a sort of a literature and history professor, moved into interdisciplinary curriculum. And from there, I went to faculty development. And now I am a library director. And I feel like in speaking to librarians, I feel like that's that's the epicenter, you know, and the the understanding of the future of libraries, whether they be public libraries or academic libraries or academic public libraries. Um, I just feel like you have an incredible opportunity to spend all of your time focusing on these kinds of questions because they are at the heart of libraries. You know, um, every, every, it's, a, it's an epicenter for all of this work. So I would just say, if you are a library director um, or a librarian, bring these conversations to your strategic planning, to your visioning, to your weekly staff meetings. We've done all of this stuff and at the beginning, it was hard, you know, because it was like, you know, how, right? Um, but over time, we've started building, you know, uh, into our daily work. And I think we've also started modeling for our institution and our community what it means to make visible these kinds of conversations and strategies. So I just want to say thank you to librarians. I, I really believe this is a great place for this work to happen. Just one word for the librarians. I think you are doing great work in data management plans, but I, 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 I feel there's a gap still on how to navigate licensing and copyright issues. And this is really an issue that I guess the librarians can be great advocates for most educators, especially in the countries that are developing. 
Mm. Yes. Well, thank you all for being with us. I know we went a little bit longer than expected, but you are, as usual, very generous with your time and with your expertise. And I hope that uh, our audience today and the ones that are going to look at this video in uh, our YouTube channel afterwards will think about going back to this book if they already have it ended or uh, start searching for inspiration there. And I'm not talking about inspiration in general, I'm talking about inspiration for action, because that's what, what it's meant to be. And starting from the manifesto that uh, you, Catherine and Laura, put at the beginning of the book with everything else, and also maybe consider going to uh, going forward to uh, the, con the, mm, sorry, the materials that you shared after mm, your keynote speech at OER24 conference, because everything that uh, was in there is also food for thought about how to move forward without uh, avoiding uh, facing the, the real challenges that we have in front of us today. It's good to see that uh, the community is here and that we are ready to act and not only to talk. So thank you all for your commitment and uh, thank Andrea for your help today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Paula, for all you do so beautifully. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank nice you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye.